What I want to talk to you about today is, in particular, we talked last week about some of FDR's enemies. We talked mm -hmm. about Joe Kennedy and Al Smith, um, Huey Long and Father Coughlin and some others. Um, we talked a little bit about Eleanor's enemies and, she's and her enemies. Um, and I think being involved on a political level, you're going to have enemies on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, certainly people who are conservative have liberal enemies and vice versa. The Roosevelt's had their fair share of enemies, um, both of them. But at that time, too, it was also seen as somewhat unseemly to attack a woman. So some of Eleanor's stuff, she crossed so many different lines as first lady. She wasn't just quiet in the corner hosting teas. She and got some of that response back. Um, but I think sometimes in some ways it was a little more muted than what happened to Franklin. This is an A&H example, like I said last week, when Elizabeth Custer died in 1933, she was General Custer's widow. Um, no one ever said a bad word about the general until after she died. And a month after she passed away, the first anti-Custer book came out. Different world, different norms, different societal expectations. Um, but the Roosevelt certainly had their enemies. We talked a bit about those last week. What I want to talk about this week is some character sketches of some of their friends. Um, they both had intense, intense friendships um, with people. And I think it says a lot about their ability and willingness to learn and uh, challenge themselves to have the kind of friends that they had. Um, it's certainly in our political world today, I don't know how they would have survived in this day of Twitter and Instagram and everything with the relationships they did, I can imagine what the people at certain networks would be saying about the Roosevelts today. Um, they didn't seem to care. They, around them coalesced some of the best and brightest minds in the country. It didn't matter who they were, where they came from. Um, they were willing to share their ideas with the Roosevelts and the Roosevelts were willing to listen and adapt and change and refocus their efforts on things based on what some of their friends were telling them. Um, I don't think you would have seen a President Roosevelt have someone come up to the lectern and talk about an issue and have him kind of shove them in the side and act like he knew more what he was talking about. That's not how he worked. Um, he was willing to listen and adapt his own thinking if he thought it was to be better for the country. Um, and that happened partially because he had people around him who felt that their unfettered access to him um, allowed them to say what they wanted to say and that he was big enough to listen, disagree if he had to, but change his philosophy, change his ideas, adapt as time went on, made him a better leader, a better president, um, and the like. So let's talk a little bit about some of these folks because they're quite fascinating. Let's um, talk about, first off, one of my fast, most fascinating people in American history that no one really knows about, um, it's Henry Wallace. Now, this book is written by John Culver, who was a former senator from Iowa, who's now since passed away. Um, but this book, American Dreamer, is a fascinating story. I had n knew nothing about Henry Wallace, nothing, other than he was Roosevelt's vice president. I didn't know that he was Iowa-born, just like Harry Hopkins was, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, Smart, his father was involved, and family were involved in agriculture forever. Um, they wrote literally books on agriculture. They wrote papers on agriculture. Um, they wrote, put out newspapers on agriculture and other stuff. If you needed to find someone who knew a little bit of agriculture, as the country goes into this slide with the Great Depression, and part of the problem is what's happening with the crops and the dust bowl and, and things that people can't control, but it's wiping out farms across the country. Henry Wallace is your guy. Um, big lanky fellow, um, goes to work for FDR. It doesn't take much in FDR circle. If he hears about you and brings you on board to help him out with a question, um, and he likes what you're saying, um, then he'll bring you into his inner circle pretty fast. So Henry Wallace had been a, a lecturer. Um, his father had been secretary of agriculture. And he meets FDR in 1932. So as he's running for president, he gives him some ideas on farm policy. And when FDR gets elected, he brings in Henry Wallace as Secretary of Agriculture. It's very quick. He understands that if you want a person of respectability, of knowledge and know-how, 
um, running our agriculture program, this is the guy. Unlike some other people, I mean, John Kennedy picked Orville Freeman to be agriculture secretary. We didn't know each other very well. He knew a little bit, but not a ton. Um, Roosevelt had an instant connection with Wallace um, and brought him on board. It was a redemption for Wallace because his father had been really frozen out of the Coolidge administration when he was agriculture secretary back then. And Wallace felt it led to his father's early demise. And he was the first thing he did when he walked in the agriculture building, which is a pretty big building in DC, was find the official portrait of his father and hang it up even before he did anything else. That was his way of like saying, look, dad, we've come back. <clears throat> we're back where we're supposed to be. Um, but just a, a guy whose brain was working all the time. You know those people. Their brains never stop working. Um, his big task as it should be for any government leader in a time of crisis, is to calm people down. Not further up their fears and stoke their fears, to calm people down, to get them from doing crazy things um, that aren't going to help them or other people around them. Um, and he does a pretty good job with that. He stays as agriculture secretary for the first two Roosevelt administrations. Um, he oversees not just by theory and process, but actually goes out and visits farms um, and talks to farmers. You can imagine what it's like being a farmer in some small town and the agriculture secretary comes to visit you and talks to you about what are you doing right? What are you doing wrong? How can we increase your yield? What can we do to make your um, your crops come in better? He, he knows it's not just a policy thing. He knows how to really do that. Um, and so I think that's really makes him the perfect salesman for the agriculture program for the Roosevelt administration. He knows it. This is literally in his DNA. So when Roosevelt runs for a second term in 1940, he and John Garner, let's say they're not very close as president and vice president. This isn't a Carter Mondale or an Obama Biden or um, Bush Gore or Clinton Gore relationship. This is um, pretty fraught. It's not really close. <clears throat> so he wants a new vice president. Garner's not well. Garner's very conservative. He's not supporting all the stuff FDR does. So FDR wants someone who's going to be on the team and really support him. So he picks Wallace to be vice president. And why not? you got a guy now that can be vice president who's young enough. Something happens to Roosevelt. He knows government in and out. He knows how to get things done. Just the kind of person you want to be vice president. Um, so he taps Wallace to be his VP. And Wallace uh, joins the ticket and is elected with him. Um, he spends the four years of the Roosevelt administration during wartime traveling the world. He goes and flies in missions overseas to see what's going on, to support the troops. Um, he's very active in that sense. He um, is not a passive vice president. But as happened in 1940, happens again in 1944, people look at FDR going, well, this guy can't possibly run for a fourth term. Um, I mean, look at him. He doesn't look well. He's not feeling good. Something's wrong. You can tell by pictures he's not well. We need someone new in there. And so Wallace begins, as every vice president does at some point, to entertain ideas that he can be the president. Um, so he's thinking about running for president. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the day, that all gets changed when he gets bumped off the ticket in place of Harry Truman, who has a similar background, both Midwestern farm kids. Um, but Truman's a senator. Um, has a different perspective to bring to government than Wallace does. Um, and Wallace is, is cast aside. Um, so he later becomes the Commerce Secretary. But in the post-war era, he becomes a little bit too much of an apologist for the Soviet philosophy. He's been to Moscow. He's talked to people in Moscow. Um, he's looked at their farm programs. He sees the goods and mindsets of that. But he comes, for the U.S. press in particular, too much of a Soviet apologist. There are some letters written. He's already regarded as kind of weird. There's a, there's a story back in the day um, about he was uh, kind of a seeker. He's a person always looking for a spiritual enlightenment. And there was a guy who was kind of a guru that he knew. And he wrote letters back and forth to him that got released to the public. People thought he was kind of weird anyway. Um, so he tossed that in with kind of this, I wouldn't say pro-Soviet, but at least acquiescence to Soviet ideas. He just kind of thought, well, they're not that bad. We, when the Cold War starting, and it kind of froze him out. Now, in 1948, he was the head of the Progressive Party ticket, running against Truman, um, from that far left perspective. But um, 
his career never really recovered after that. Um, there's a great, he retired to a farm in Westchester County, New York. And I love this cartoon of him after his death. One half is the American flag, the other half is cornstalk. But if you want to read a fascinating book about someone who's been totally forgotten, American Dreamer by John C. Culver is really, really, really well done. Um, and it puts Henry Wallace back in the pantheon of two great American thinkers. Um, he just kind of ran up against a political tone that was changing um, towards the end of his um, service in government. And so that kind of cast him aside. Um, you know, he goes along, another one of FDR's close friends, and we're talking about some of Eleanor's friends. We've, been, we've talked about Louis Howe. Louis Howe is this crotchety, cantankerous political reporter who met FDR um, in Albany in 1910. He's the guy in 1912 when FDR was sick uh, with pneumonia, that Louis is one who ran around Dutchess County and campaigned for him, proved that he was indispensable to Roosevelt. He was there when FDR was sick. He always called him my future president, my future and beloved, beloved and future president. Um, the kind of guy that started giving Eleanor some courage, some belief in herself that she didn't have before. Um, after a while, he would become part of the family, like so many people were that came in contact with the Roosevelts. You weren't just in and out of the door. You were in there, you ate dinner with them, you slept at their house, you went swimming with them, you would spend time on vacation with them. Louis House that way. He's the guy that always kept Franklin's eye on what was coming down the road. Whenever Franklin would kind of falter and say, well, I don't know if I can do this, I would say, no, Franklin, there's our goal. That big white house down there, that's where we're going. Um, to, to the detriment of his own family, his kids never saw him, his wife never saw him. They lived in Massachusetts. Um, they didn't see him very often. His number one love and number one goal was to get Franklin Roosevelt like the president because he knew in his heart of hearts that FDR could do great things. But someone has to help him get that. Um, and so the question comes into relationships too. With this, what is he? Is he a really good friend? Because he gets paid by the Roosevelts for a long time. Can a person be your friend that you're paying? How does that dynamic work out? Um, it's interesting to kind of ponder those things. We've talked about the Roosevelts and their friendships and their alliances. What's the difference between those people that are just allies as opposed to friends? I think if you're laying in in the room while the president, the future president, is stick with polio and you're helping care for him you're no longer just an employee or a friend that 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 says a lot about louis he was with the eleanor when franklin was sick at hyde park in, in campobello he was there helping change his clothes and give him leg massages and stuff like that that's not what the average political consultant does that's above and beyond the call so um i won't talk about missy lahand because we're going to do that later <laughs> on the week, but I was, I have a copy of this book in my collection by Grace Tully called FDR, My Boss. Now, Grace was FDR's secretary after Missy um, got sick. And Missy had had a series of strokes and um, had fallen on some hard times and was no longer able to work. And she'd gone to a rest home um, and she died during the war, relatively young. Um, but luckily for her, she had a backup, and the backup was Grace Tully, or Tully as she was known around the White House. And she had come on board, like so many of these folks do, they have a connection with um, politics in New York. I gotta find the sheets right up about her. Uh, there she is. She's born in 1900 in Northern New Jersey. Um, her father was very much involved in democratic politics, so she has kind of an entree into what's going on. She pays attention. Um, and as so many women at the time did, because they really had not a lot of options open up to them, um, she became a secretary. That was kind of where a lot of women went to do something with themselves, like some kind of impact on society, make some money, um, was secretarial school. And that's where they went. Um, and she did that. She went to do that. And her first job out of secretarial school, based probably her family connections, a lot of folks don't get to do this, it's working for the Diocese of New York. And that's not a bad place to go if you're, you're I mean, most people get like a entry level job at, you know, Radio Shack or, you know, something like that in the back, 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 back room doing something. But to get a job working for the Archbishop of New York 
in the diocese office is not a bad gig. Nice place to work. Uh, she clearly felt comfortable with these folks and that kind of job. Got to see a lot of things. Um, it's kind of interesting to be in that kind of job, your first job, to learn discretion. And I think this is what makes Grace Tully such a fascinating person, is discretion is so important. Um, and being able to keep your mouth shut, being able to look the other way so that people can learn to trust you. Um, I'm reading a book about the Beatles, and this guy was talking about a woman he knew had gone, she lived in West Virginia, she got a job working for the IRS, and her job was a secretarial job, and she went to the IRS, and part of the job was sitting around opening up people's tax returns and helping process them. Requires some discretion. You can't go home and talk about, oh my God, I did so and so's taxes. Well, this one young gal went to work the first day, and she's going through kind of a mind numbing job, and all of a sudden she starts screaming. And screaming, she can't stop screaming. She got fired because she was screaming because she opened up Elvis's tax returns and she couldn't believe it. My Elvis's tax returns, oh! you can't have people like that working on that place. You can't, that's a violation of the rules. So Grace Tully was very good at her job because she kept her mouth shut. Um, and you need to have someone at that level not going, hey, psst, I can't like send this, let's get to this report, there's something going on at this job. Just keep your mouth quiet, do your job. Be loyal to the people that work that you work for. That's something that's really important to people in power, particularly. Um, in 1928, she was looking for a change. She she gets a job with the Democratic National Committee in New York, kind of a local branch. And in doing that, um, she does a good enough job that someone notices and bumps her up and says, "Hey, why don't you go work for Mrs. Roosevelt? Her husband's running for governor." Uh, you can get to know them a little bit. So she does. She goes out to work for the Roosevelt's, particularly Eleanor. Um, and she and Eleanor become close first. Um, then Eleanor sees in her a skill that can be used in other ways. And so she's bumped in to work for FDR. She works for Missy at this time. Um, and she really assists Missy with stuff that Missy doesn't like to do. There are certain things that Missy, I think, at this point, she's been in, in power for a long time with Franklin. We'll talk more about that. Um, Wednesday, but Missy doesn't like to like sort letters and all this other stuff. So she lets Grace do that. And Grace does it with a great deal of charm and grace. Uh, um, and that gets noticed, she becomes Missy's assistant. And so the two of them become close. The more and more time they spend together, the more um, things Missy gets her to do that are important, the more respect she gets. Um, I apologize in about two seconds, my wife just came home and the dog's gonna bark, um, but that's the way it goes. She served all four years in Albany with the Roosevelt's as when he was governor. And then she was fortunate enough to then go with them. She's no longer working for the DNC in that aspect. She's working for them and she goes to the White House. Um, Hi. Yeah. Excuse me. You keep using the word, I'm very ignorant when you're saying the word Missy. What do you mean? Missy is, Missy Lahand is this woman's name. Okay. And we'll hear about, we'll hear about her on Wednesday. That's who Catherine's gonna talk, Missy Lahand was the president. Okay chief secretary and grace is working for her now okay uh, so she's working for missy yeah in the white house she's right. not <laughs> as intimate with franklin as missy is she does not walk through the upstairs of the white house in her dressing gown to see what's going on and talk to the president she works down in the oval office um but she's very loyal she goes with him all over the country after missy dies she takes over missy's job um she becomes the number one secretary to the president. That's a pretty important job to have. And you're trusted for your discretion. Um, and she pays them back by not saying a word. Um, not until later on, she read a book about him. Um, she's with him in April of 1945. She is at Warm Springs when he dies. Um, and she obviously knows that Lucy Mercer is there, but doesn't say a word. Um, and that's an important discretionary thing to have as far as Franklin's concerned. She's one of the people she could keep Eleanor's secrets and Franklin's secrets, never the twain shall meet. That's a person who's very good at their job. Um, she later then goes on, she runs, she's the executive secretary of the FDR Foundation when it's set up, um, which is kind of the burgeoning FDR library process and uh, foundation set up to kind of further FDR's ideals and Eleanor's ideals. She's the first person in charge of that. Um, and she then gets a job for the Democratic Senate Policy Committee, and she works for Lyndon Johnson. 
of all people. Now, Lyndon had to enjoy, not to look at some stuff on Lyndon, had to love the fact that FDR secretary was working with his group because Lyndon Johnson is nothing but a FDR aficionado. He's marketed himself as a New Deal Democrat in Texas um, as much as he can. Um, and to have Grace Tully had to be a great thing for him. He could probably sit there and ask a question and pump her for information about what was the FDR really like? What did he really think? Am I doing the right stuff like FDR? That kind of thing. Um, it'd be like me having, and I had a friendship with a guy who was um, worked for Jack Kennedy named Billy Sutton. And I interviewed him for my master's thesis and we got to be friends. And the last time I saw him before he passed away, we were talking and he said, Jack, Mike, Jack, what I liked you. Oh, it's kind of cool. Jack, Jack Kennedy will like me. Well, a month later, Billy died and I went to his funeral down in Charlestown. And I interviewed, a, I went over and talked to a guy who had given the eulogy. His name was David Nyhan. He was a columnist for the Pope, the Washington Globe. And he's since passed away too. And I said, Mr. Nyhan, that was a great eulogy. You really captured Billy Sutton's personality really, really well. That was really nice. He said, oh, well, thank you. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Wyoming. He goes, is your name Mike Bell? I go, yeah. He goes, do you know Mike Bell? Billy loved you. And for me, that meant more than what Billy had said the month before. The fact that Billy thought highly of me. So that must have been what LBJ had looked. Here you're talking to Grace Tully and getting ideas and Grace Tully to be that close to a person you so admire. Now, LBJ had met FTR a few times, but they weren't intimates at any time. So he probably got more information about how this operated and how LBJ thought by talking to Grace Tully than they ever could have thought to get working for FTR, FTR at all. She retired in 1965. So she stayed in her kind of business for another 20 years after Roosevelt died, and she died in 1984. Now, a lot of folks never heard of her. She shows up in miniseries and books once in a while. But one of the things that's fascinating about history is archives. Now, you all, a bunch of you have been to the Kennedy Archives down in Boston with me a couple years ago. And they've done an amazing job of you can go down and you want to do a research project. You can go down, sit in a room, and you can ask for original paperwork on things. And they bring it to you in a box. you got to wear gloves and all that stuff. But you actually touch history and feel history. Um, they now have, a lot of these post places have digitized the records they have. So you can do it online now. You don't have to go to Boston. I love to go to see this stuff. I'm watching a series. I've watched more about English history in the last month than I ever thought I would. Because there's great shows. And that we, John and I watched a show about the Great Fire the other day on the BBC. It was fascinating. But I'm watching a um, series, they call them, on Jane Grey, the nine-day Queen of England. And when she was executed, she went to the, the block with a prayer book in her hand. And I'm just about the point in the documentary where they're handing the historian who's doing the program the actual prayer book that Jane Grey had in her hand when she was killed. I'm like, whoa, that's so cool. This gives you shivers, right? Um, so Grace Tully admitted in an interview at one point before she died, she had a trove of FDR paperwork. And they said, well, we should get this. You should get, give this one. No, no, no. My family will take care of it when I'm, after I'm gone. Well, after she dies, the Roosevelt Library is like, hey, 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 where's the stuff? And the family doesn't respond. They don't, they don't agree to give the stuff away. And then suddenly it shows up in an auction block in New York. And it turns out there are like 5,000 pieces of paper photographs, letters, correspondence um, in this collection. And they have to actually go through a um, legal process to get them. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Conrad Black, who wrote, I think, what is regarded as the best, one of the best biographies of FDR. I have to make sure I can see myself. I don't know if you guys can see it. Called FDR, Champion of Freedom. Uh, this is 1,500 pages long. This is a doorstop. Um, but this is an amazing book. Um, interestingly enough, um, Lord Black went to jail for fraud, I think, a few years ago. So, but no comment on his book, except that he ended up buying a lot of the paper. No, Mary's got to mute herself. Okay. Hey, Mary. Yeah. Mute yourself, please. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, so the stuff sits around, and there's 5,000 pages of documents. And years of negotiations result in the stuff eventually going to the Roosevelt Library. 
but it literally takes an act of Congress to do it. You can't, this is stuff that belongs to the President of the United States. It does not belong in a private collection. This is state documents. This needs to go somewhere where it can be taken care of. And it reminds me of a story a couple years ago in Florida. A guy came up, he had an auction of stuff that belonged to JFK. Now, Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, had taken a bunch of stuff after he died. <coughs> a bunch of it was paperwork. But it was like his watch, um, you know, things like that, his uh, briefcase that belonged to him. And when the stuff came online, John Jr. and Caroline were like, whoa, 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 this belongs to the family, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so some of that stuff was taken off the auction block and given to the JFK Library because of this act of Congress that talks about the legal, what constitutes a private thing and what constitutes state documents. Um, but Grace Tully's 5,000 pages of stuff had disappeared and shown back up and it took an act of Congress to get them to have to give it to the FDR Library so that it can be used by people like us to do research. When I was in... Um, Keene, New Hampshire, a few years ago, doing research about Jonathan Daniels, and I went into the county library, and they had one box of stuff that belonged to Jonathan and some things about Jonathan Daniels. And I easily could have taken those things and put them in my coat and walked out. It wasn't hard to do. And so a friend of Jonathan's, who's become a friend of mine, had a bunch of things um, that she wanted to give somewhere so people could use them and, and, and discuss them. And she was going to give them to the county library. And I said, no, 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 don't do that. Let's give them to the school where he went to school. They have a much more tightly controlled access and archives. Because these things are important and they shouldn't just be disappearing and going into private collections. They should be uh, in, in places where people can use them. Amy's family had a bunch of letters written um, by her great uncles during the Civil War. And they're great letters because they're, they're just the head the Artwork in them is, is fun to watch, look at. Um, the things they're talking about are fun to look at and read. But they shouldn't just, they should be allowed someone can take care of them. And so we sent the originals. I was in Virginia for a conference and we gave them to University of Virginia in Richmond so that they could put them in their archives and digitize them. So if someone's doing Civil War research and wants to read about Union soldiers' perspective on the Peninsula Campaign in 1862, there's actual letters they can look at. And that's what Grace Tully as a state finally did was give that stuff. This is not stuff that can be make to people making a buck off of. This is stuff that really is important to the furthering of study of history. And it took an act of Congress to get that stuff to the FDR library. Um, so they, I think that you can go online now to the FDR library uh, and look at the Grace Tully collection. They finally digitized it all. You can access it from home, which I think is absolutely amazing. I myself like to go look at it myself, but you all that don't want to drive six hours, you can go online and, and look at this stuff now. Another person that was fascinating in, El in Franklin's life is his cousin, Daisy Sookley. Mike, uh, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. About presidential libraries. Yeah. Who, does, who decides, for instance, um, with so much online now and the press doing so much, Who's going to decide, for instance, about this president, what goes into his library? You know, the first thing they do is anything that comes out of the White House goes in there. And that's, that's the first marker. But then, um, I don't know. I'll have to look into that, man. That's a good question. I'll talk to my friend Jim at the library in Boston and see what he says, because that's a fascinating question. Yeah, All because, because what I, I'm wondering is, you know, a lot of it is not very flattering. So right. does the president's people get to choose what goes in there? I don't think they get to choose what goes in there, but they can certainly choose what comes out. Does that make okay. sense? So anything that is written in the White House, this is the problem with Grace Tully's stuff. This was a, these were government documents about government policy and somebody was trying to sell them. They said, no, you can't do that. So stuff goes in to libraries, but what comes out, what gets released, like the Kennedy family controlled for a long time who had access to stuff and what they had access about. Um, and you can see that if you went to, when I first went there 30 years ago to the library in Boston, what was for sale in the bookstore was indicative of what stuff they were controlling to come out. So all the books at the time were very flattering and positive and happy books about Kennedy. But once other stuff gets leaked and comes out, you have to change the dynamic. And so the bookstore now sells books 
that are critical of Kennedy. Um, and that's what I think because the papers, someone gets access to write the book and the people want more access to more papers. Uh, sometimes there's a time constraint on these things. And it's, digi it's different now with digital stuff. I don't know what all the policy is with digital stuff. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's government work. Um, but I'll check into that. But it, it, everything, as far as I understand, things generated by and for and at the White House automatically get stored in these places. And then how that gets out and when it's released, they can claim national security. And both parties, presidents have done that. Um, that is up to the individual libraries and families, I think, uh, to some extent. But I'll look into that, find out more about that. That's a good, really good question. I'm writing that down right now. Presidential libraries. Thanks, Marilyn, for that question. Um, the other person that comes along that is, is an intimate of FDRs um, is his cousin, Margaret Sukwik. Um, she's born a few miles north of him, a few years after him. There are six cousins, I believe. Um, she knew him when she was a kid. Um, the kind of paths kind of crossed. They're kind of the same uh, Hudson Valley gentry. You know, those folks, they're kind of peers. Um, she goes to Bryn Mawr, Bryn Mawr College for two years. Then her mom decides that women shouldn't be at a school that educates women. Not unlike what you hear about Francis Perkins sometimes. Like, oh, you went to college? What are you talking about? Oh, you're trouble now. Um, and she connects with him after he becomes president, really. She kind of works as a nurse for a while. But he's looking for someone at some point in his life that he can just vent to and talk to that any thought that things are gonna go any further than that, uh, he can talk about Eleanor, he can talk about the presidency, he can talk about people he knows, and he trusts her not to say anything. She doesn't, but she keeps a pretty accurate diary um, and record, and her book, a book written called Closest Companion by Jeffrey Ward, he's a fantastic Roosevelt historian. Um, he wrote the book, um, what is it called, the back of my head? Um, Oh, First Class Temperament, which is one of my favorite FDR books. But this book is a collection. He interviewed Daisy Suckley and had access to her diaries. Um, and she's, she's obviously all the time worried about his health. She's worried about people that come in and, and bother him. Um, a lot of this stuff, he asked her to destroy some letters. They were too personal. But there's a very deep relationship here. I don't think there's an, any odd component to it, although she's further removed than Lisha Wise and Eleanor was from him. But it's, it's just this intimate friendship. Um, everyone needs that person you can kind of just vent to, not necessarily your spouse or your brother or your sister, someone else you can just vent to. Um, she becomes that person. She's with him all the time. She was probably with him more than anyone else during his presidency. She had unfettered access. She lived at the White House. She was with him in Warm Springs. They did a movie a couple years ago called Hyde Park on Hudson. And Bill Murray played FDR. And Laura Linney played uh, Daisy. Um, interesting movie. Not the greatest acted film in the world. Um, and there's some implications in that relationship that there's no proof for. But clearly the greatest intimate friendship of his time. Um, she was a spinster, so she had no husband, and this was in her way. She gave all her time and effort and love to FDR. Um, he trusted her enough that there are maybe three or four pictures taken of FDR in a wheelchair when he was president. Two of them were taken by Daisy. He knew she wouldn't sell them to the papers and put them out. He let her photograph him in his natural surroundings. Um, and that says something about his trust. The other thing about her, well, she raised Scotty Terriers. She gave him Fallow. And we all know how tight he was with Fallow. I mean, that, that's part of the image of FDR is the dog. Jonathan has, one of the things they sell at the Hyde Park Library is stuffed dogs, stuffed Fallows. Um, so she gave him his dog, who's so much a part of his legacy today. Um, so if you get a chance, you want to watch the movie Hyde Park on Hudson, it's pretty good. Um, in some senses. Apparently there was some evidence that they were planning on retiring and building a house together. Well, I don't know what that was gonna do with Eleanor, but there was a place called Pop Cottage. There was 
Springwood, which is the main house. There's Val Kill, which is Eleanor's place. And then they're building a place up the hill a bit called Pop Cottage. And they were going to retire there together. Um, I don't know how that would have worked after the presidency, but we don't have to worry about it too much because it didn't because he passed away. Um, she lived to be in her 90s. She died in 1999, 1991. She, I think, is just short of 90 years old. And she, again, trusted someone finally to put this book out. Um, there are 38 letters from FDR to her, but there were more that he wrote that she destroyed. So she knew, I think, that if these letters came out and they found these kind of acts by accident, um, that um, the really, whatever was in those interesting ones, we can speculate, coulda, shoulda, woulda, kind of history, but we don't know. But um, it's a fascinating book. I, I'd recommend this one to people. Closest companion. For just another perspective on uh, on Franklin Roosevelt. <laughs> so let's talk about one of the friends of Franklin, and then we'll talk about a couple of friends of Eleanor's, which are even more fascinating than these folks. We all know this good lady, Frances Perkins. She's got a strong Maine connection. She's laid to rest here in Maine, down in Damariscotta. Um, I would like to go. She's the reason I'm teaching this class. I want to show if I can find Mick O'Halloran and see if we go on. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, Mick, a class had been, one of his classes had been down there to the, the Perkins Center, and there was going to be a change of leadership at the institute that they have down there. And her grandson, I believe Mick was it, he was the one who was running it and giving the tours and talking to people. And we had hoped to kind of make a connection. And I never really heard from them, but I did find out that we only could take 16 people down at a time. Uh, it's even before social distancing. Uh, so we kind of tweaked the idea for this class, but she's the reason we're doing this class. She's one of the most fascinating people I've ever read about in all the reading I've done. I started this book and read it in like a day and a half. It's pretty dog-eared and, and highlighted. Um, if, you had it, if you have a chance, you could probably still go online and watch the PBS documentary about her that was on last month. Um, a woman who took, never took no for an answer. Mike, what was the name of the book again? The Woman Behind the New Deal. And the author's name is Kristen, Kirsten Downey. And if you've noticed, on if you have Amazon, they're starting to pick things up a little bit. So things aren't taking like a month anymore. They're taking like a week, maybe a couple of days. <clears throat> but this is a great book. You want to read about the New Deal and who really helped shape it. It's Frances Perkins. Um, she got her eyes opened up when she watched the Triangle Shirt Fire happen. She saw people jumping out of buildings to their death. She thought that was absolutely horrible. She's well-educated. Again, a unique thing for one one of her time. Uh, she goes through her entire career always being resented by the guys in the room. Um, she marries. She Her husband is, is mentally ill and really struggles with mental health issues his entire life. Um, and so another person who kind of gives up her time and effort to government service. I don't think her marriage is very happy. It's there. But to get out of the house, to get away from having to take care of her husband, she throws herself into her work. And she very quickly becomes um, known in New York political circles. Al Smith's one of the first people in power to recognize her and give her things to do. She meets FDR. Um, and he sees this brain that's going nine times faster than anybody else's. Um, that's a compassionate brain that thinks of other people. Um, one of the things we don't talk about a lot in Francis Perkins, and there should be a little more of that, and they didn't talk about it. They talk about it somewhat, but um, she's a, a person of deep, deep, deep faith. She's a big fan of Thomas Aquinas. Um, this is what I, she said about Christians must regard entrance into politics and political activity as a major Christian duty, and they must enter it as Christians. Now, not the sense that we see it defined today, kind of a narrow born-again Christians, conservative Christians, evangelical Christians, but more of a Dr. King Christianity, uh, the social gospel, as it was, uh, that God wants people to be taken care of, and if you have the ability to do that, you should do that. That's your goal in life is to help people out. Um, she's the one that comes up unemployment insurance. 
Social Security, things that are really saving people's bacon right now, we can thank Frances Perkins for. The stuff that she put in place, the work that she did, is still with us 80 years later, and it's saving people's bacon right now. That's her legacy, I think, at the end of the day. She was a phenomenal, tough woman. Um, a lot of guys felt they could underestimate her. You don't want to do that. They tried more than once to outfox her in political stuff. You don't want to do that. Um, she knew um, where power was and how to work the levers of power. She would work herself in such a, uh, a state of uh, exhaustion that when she got done, I think, working on the Social Security stuff, which people weren't a big fan of at the time, she came back to Maine for like two or three weeks and just slept. She was so exhausted. Um, if you look at stories about the Roosevelt administration, um, she always wore these hats. And a lot of them are kind of a tricorner looking hat. You can always find her in pictures because she's always, um, she stands out. I'll show you the picture from this article. Uh, she's right behind Franklin with a little tricorner hat. You can always find her in a picture. It's very, very, very smart. The social conscience, I think, of um, FDR. You know, if he thought he was getting her into the office to let her talk for him and he'd shut her up and she'd go away, he must took what she was doing too. She's just a brilliant architect for helping people out. Um, and she has an interesting life too, because like I said, her husband is, is often mentally ill, struggles with depression, um, and she lives with um, a woman they don't know if it's a romantic relationship, but it seems to be, um, who dies in a horse accident, which sends her off the edge of mental health stuff herself. Um, she has a fraught relationship with her daughter. But she stays involved in government her entire life. She stays involved with the Roosevelts. Um, she's one of the few people that stays with the administration all the way through to the end. Um, and I think really her, 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 her testimony, her legacy, um, is the fact that today, as we're struggling with what we're struggling with, a lot of folks have um, access to things that are helping them because of Frances Perkins. Because she wouldn't take no for an answer. Because she knew how to get FDR to act, how to appeal to his conscience, and how to get him to focus on things that were more important than just himself. And because she had this great political skill to get things done. Mike? Yeah. She also, really never was very poor. In fact, they were, they had, she was more upper middle class, wasn't she? Yeah, she did okay. There were times when it got kind of tight for him, when her husband wasn't working or something like that, but she, yeah, she was definitely of a patrician class, um, but she knew, and I don't know if she felt responsible, but I think she modeled the, the uh, biblical admonition that of to whom much is given, much is required. If you have, and she talked about that as far as the or stuff in the church, if you have access and have been given, have been blessed with a certain abundance, you should find ways to spread that and to make sure that no one is destitute and has nothing. Um, I think that's a common thread that runs through where people are from at the time, what their social class is, things like that. Does that make sense? The patrician class, we may look upon them with, with a, a skewered view, but some of them really thought it was their job and, and their holy obligation to help other people of less fortunate than them. And she combines that with a real tough nosed um, political skills and does not let men kick her, push her around. <laughs> you, don't, you don't do that. Roberta, do you have a question? Um, just a comment. She was also the very first woman to serve on the yeah. cabinet. And she served all the all the time Roosevelt was president. Every time there's a Madeleine Albright or a Condoleezza Rice or anyone um, since then who's come on who's a woman that served in the cabinet, they owe it to her. Um, but I think at some points, from what I read between the lines, there was a sense that FDR thought by giving her the job, he could kind of placate her. I don't think it's, at the end of the day that was the case. No, she loved coming back to Maine. She's buried in Damariscotta at the home. And there, I think if any of us go down when this is all done, if you go down, there's not that far down the road for most of us, go down and thank her. 
for what she did because people literally are having their um their backside saved because of her. We should write a editorial for the newspaper right now about her. I mean, we will do that. I have nothing else to do. There's there another one. Presidential <laughs> libraries and letter to the editor. Okay. <laughs> and I'll sign it, Roberta Morin. Mayor of uh, Albion. <laughs> Mike, I wanted to mention that uh, she's revered by the Lincoln County Democratic Group. They have okay. something called the Francis Perkins Club. Okay. And and she's a real heroine in in this area, yeah. Yeah. to yeah. which I belong. Oh, good. Oh, there you go. So, so we look up to her. You should. Um, there's a thing during Lent, the Episcopal Church does, called... Um, it's like a Lent bracket, and it's, I can't remember the name of it, and they do, like, rather than a basketball bracket, they do, like, a uh, Lenten Heroes bracket, and a couple years ago, it literally came down to her and versus Jonathan Daniels. As much as I love her and think she was awesome, I had to pick Jonathan Daniels, but um, she's highly regarded, not just because she, her faith was a big driving force in her, her background, and so sometimes when people talk about we should separate 100% people's faith lives, and what they do in politics, look to her, look to Dr. King. That just becomes, you don't like what the other side is saying about their version of faith and politics. But I, she I never- wondered, Mike, was she criticized? Because her policies were certainly very progressive. And in today's world, she'd be called a socialist or a communist. Yeah, I mean, that's possible. Yeah, she was criticized. Uh, a, for being a woman in government, who, who the hell does that? What does she think she's doing? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Part of her her struggles in the, in the office was was getting the men in the government who were on, supposedly on her side to support what she was doing, and and getting the press to support what she was doing. But she's not afraid to go after people and work with them and sit down and negotiate with them and talk to them and listen to them. Uh, she's a very shrewd. You don't get things done in politics by not listening. And not adapting. She did all those things and did them quite well. Um, it's amazing that there's, uh, she wrote a book about Franklin too that I was going to get checked out from the library, but now the library is closed. So, but read more about her. If you can check out the PBS documentary, it was just on in March. And it, it really does a good job um, at getting at her role shaping the New Deal, and being the conscious behind the New Deal. Um, unbelievable woman um and a friend of both frank and eleanor she says friends eleanor until um till the very end Mike, yep yeah. um how did she actually get there i mean i know you talked a little bit about it but i mean she's well educated she had jobs it's it's about connecting with people she okay. was smart she was an activist she was a social worker she was well married um, and all those things can come together to help you kind of further your standing. Okay. And if you're just necessarily a reporter or a social worker, who cares what you think? But if you're a okay. social worker and a person who has a background and, and you're married well and you start mixing okay. in circles, okay. people know who you are and kind of okay. listen to you a little bit more. You, you know, you got to kind of, sometimes it's about getting that lucky break okay. and getting out there. But she just kind of got on the ladder and kept climbing the ladder rung after rung after rung. She's very dogged in pursuing what she wants to do and, and, and better people's lives. So she's like I said. And Mike? Fine. Yeah. Yeah, and she really started out as a social worker, didn't yeah. she? Yeah. yeah, and then she didn't even go. She went to all the places. She went down in a coal mine once yeah. to yeah. see how things were. Yeah. So wow. like I said, you want hands, hands on excuse like Henry Wallace. Right. These, folks, these folks did not do what they do today. You're secretary of something. You go, like, okay, I'm in my job in D.C., all the press uh -huh. they went right. out and climbed down into the coal mines. They went into the farm fields. They worked with the trees. They, they hands on stuff because they all knew instinctively that the president couldn't do that very much. So they right. had to. Okay. One of them. Get okay. the book. She's absolutely an amazing woman. Absolutely okay. a, a real American hero. Mike. Yeah. In response to Priscilla's question about how did she even get with that job, yep. she worked for. FDR when he was the governor of New right. York, yep. and she oh, okay. with her. Right. Okay. She approached her about this job. She really didn't want it. By then, she had this husband who had problems. Yep. She had yep. a daughter. Yeah. Um, and so 
she had the story is, and this is shared by her grandson. Yeah. She had a little piece of paper in her pocket where she had written down all these big, huge things she wanted to do. And she went in and talked with him and said, look, if, if I'm going to take this job, you have to stay out of my way. This is what yep. I want to do. Yep. And he agreed that he would not necessarily support all these things, but he would stay out of her way and oh, wow. kind of see where it went. Yep. And then okay. her decision to wear the matronly suits and hats and yep. I mean, without fail was so that she would appear matronly. Yeah. Okay. And she wanted to work with these men as close you know, yeah. their level as she yeah. could. Oh, that, wow. that, that, that's, that's, that's an example of her political skills. Okay. Yeah. Because she knows perception is reality in politics. Okay. So you're exactly right. So if, if, if it's, you know, looking a certain way is going to help the men accept you, she's mm -hmm. willing to do that okay. without selling herself out. Um, the, when she went home in the summers, apparently, after she had her couple of weeks of bed rest, <laughs> She would get up and she would wear much more, yeah. you know, feminine clothes and she would entertain yeah. her local friends and she was a regular okay. friend. Well, okay. that was the one thing I wish they had done more in the documentary about that part of her they personality. Did yeah. Yeah. They, they talked did. about the policy, which yeah. was great. Right. But there's a right. whole other side, which is why the book is so great. She had this long drawn out affair with E.H. Harriman's daughter. There, there's another part of the relationship that we don't hear about. Um, that's fascinating to get into, um, but you know, you, she 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 did work for Al Smith. That's how she got to know FDR. She kind of kept going on, and she, she was right. She did not want to necessarily. Continue. She was getting tired and exhausted. She has this family to take care of, and FDR really wanted her brains in there. And she had that piece of paper, and I love the fact that she kept that list of things she wanted to do. And he's like, okay, and to get FDR to stay out of your business is tough. <laughs> Right, and that's that's a wow. Weird. Um, so that's her political skill. She, he was involved because his name's going to be attached to all of this stuff. Too. And so, and he gets the credit. Yeah, but yeah, but I think we're seeing more of that. Um, and she's one of those people I think too. The policy. Um, I hate to use the name in this course, but Ronald Reagan always said, "Policy is good, as, and it, as long as you don't mind who gets the credit." She let other people take the credit for stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and FDR is going to get his name attached because he's the president. Uh, and that's just the way things kind of shake out sometimes. But there's more and more stuff about her. I thought the documentary was a great way to introduce her to us. But there's so much more to her. She's so much more complicated than just her policy initiatives. That alone in itself is amazing work. What she did was fascinating. But there's so much more to it. So I want, to, I want to talk a bit about some people in Eleanor's life too, because there's a couple of people I want to talk about in Eleanor's life, because it's just as complicated, if not more complicated than the president's life. Um, Eleanor, as we all know, was a very shy and withdrawn uh, woman who um, had kind of taken on anything negative about her, um, said, kind of put it upon herself. Her mother called her granny. Um, just kind of, she struggled her whole life with how to how she viewed herself and other, how others viewed her. Not comfortable in large crowds. I think when she discovered the affair with Lucy Mercer, that just went to the heart of the thing. See, I really am ugly and not desirable. My husband found the first young pretty thing that came along. Um, and so Eleanor is always struggling to find someone who loves her um, in a romantic way. I think FDR and she really loved each other, but there's a certain seems to be something missing after a certain point. So she finds that in three ways, I think, over her, her life after Franklin. One of them is with Earl Miller, who is her bodyguard. Oh, as, really? as lady. Now, Earl Miller, we don't know much about him. He was born in 1897. Um, the first thing we really know about his childhood is he left home when he was 12. That's Jonathan's age. I, just, I don't know how you survive when you're 12. He joined the Navy, fought in World War I. He learned martial arts, and he got hired as a state trooper in New York. Um, he actually, what's funny, but I didn't know this, he was on, as part of a Navy crew, when FDR did his tour of Europe, when he came back and we found out about Lucy Mercer, remember that we talked about that? That's towards the end of the war. Earl Miller was actually on the boat as one of the Navy ship sea guys on that ship, which I think is amazing. So they had this connection. The Roosevelt family has this amazing ability to connect with people 
that they may or may not have known they connected with before. So they're on the same boat. And then later on, he's Eleanor's bodyguard. Gets a job working at the state police in New York. He works for Al Smith. Um, and then he comes, stays on board when Roosevelt becomes governor and is assigned to be Eleanor's bodyguard because Eleanor doesn't want to be the first lady. She hates this job. She hates the, the constraints and the life in the fishbowl, in the bubble, as they call it. She wants to just be her own self. She refuses to have protection. So FDR says, all right, if you're not going to ride in the governor's car limousine, then you have to have a bodyguard with you wherever you go. And so part of what she does as First Lady of New York is she travels all around New York, listening and talking and, and getting advice to go back then and tell Franklin what she sees, what she hears, what people are talking about. Um, she often does this incognito. I'll talk about that in a minute with another story she takes. But Earl Miller is her bodyguard, so he goes with her. So if you're traveling from Albany anywhere in New York for hours and hours and hours and hours at a time, you, and you're talking to someone, you become very close. So Earl Miller was a, was a very tall, handsome young man. Um, and even James Roosevelt feels that this was one of the few romantic relationships in Eleanor's life after Franklin, um, had, that relationship had, had changed. Now, he says that, he says the only romantic relationship, because he's not going to talk about Lorena Hickok, which we'll talk about in a minute. But people notice that Eleanor and Earl seem quite close. They notice that um, they have kind of a hidden wink and a nudge and a nod. Um, if she's talking to the press, he will often stand behind the press and make faces. So she will smile and look more at ease with what she's doing. Um, there's a, there's a, if you watch the Ken Burns documentary, there's film footage of a movie they made where she is a damsel in distress. He's a pirate. Um, he taught her how to shoot. Eleanor Roosevelt knew how to handle a gun. I know that sounds, what? Eleanor Roosevelt? But Earl Miller taught how to shoot. And that was part of the a deal that Franklin made. If you're going to travel around the state by yourself, take Earl and take, she took a gun with her wherever she went. I mean, that's just, I don't think of Eleanor Roosevelt. But she knew how to, she was a crack shot apparently too. But there was enough of a insinuation from people who saw them together, saw how she reacted when he was around, that gossip started to fly. He married three times to try to get rid of the rumors that there was something going on between he and Eleanor, including to a woman who was 17. He even dated Missy Lahan for a while to kind of dispel the rumors because he knew it was out there. Um, but he's one of these people in her life um, who comes along at the right moment. She's kind of frustrated being the first lady. This is not what she wants to do. He supports her, tells her how good she is, tells her she can do things. Tells her how beautiful she is. And again, we don't know if there's an erotic component, if they slept together physically, but there clearly is a romance there. She clearly falls in love with him and vice versa. Just by the stories we've been told, um, he talked about how, you know, trying to get rid of the gossip to marry three times, none of them took. Um, but guess who was the best man at the wedding? FDR. So um, who... <laughs> What do the Roosevelt's talk about? I would love to find a trove of letters from Franklin and Eleanor saying, Dear Franklin, Earl and I are on vacation together at the camp up in northern New York. He's so handy. Who, who knows? So did he come home and say, Eleanor, did you have a romantic weekend? But who knows? Did you sleep with, with Missy in hand? I don't know. Their dynamics are so absolutely fascinating and mind-boggling to think of how this handled, was handled back 80 years ago when it wasn't covered, what would happen today if we knew all this stuff? Well, we know because we see some of it happening, but um, it's fascinating that there's this relationship between her and her bodyguard that I'm sure started out platonically and as a employer employee relationship that at some point changed and was at the right time for her. It gave her confidence. It gave her um, a willingness to speak out and be more outspoken about stuff. And I think that's Errol Miller does a great thing um, for the country by helping provide her with some belief in herself. Um, and why not, too? Franklin's not hanging around being in love with her anymore. He's not home anymore. Just because you have that interesting aspect of marriage doesn't mean you don't have feelings and emotions and a need for physical attention and love. Um, so the next relationship she has that's fascinating is with a reporter named uh, Lorena Hickok. 
and this is the one, the most scandalous story of Eleanor Roosevelt's life, because it's the relationship she has with Eleanor Lorena Hickok, um, and it's not just best friends, they're clearly in love with each other. Um, Lorena Hickok shows up, she's a reporter. Um, she goes to work for the, the Democratic Party after a while. Um, she really is, I guess, she, if, if anyone in the world, you could say, well, how can she be impartial? She's not, she quickly learns that her feelings for Eleanor Roosevelt are more important than anything she does as an independent journalist. And her kind of independent journalism kind of goes out the window. Um, the two of them, it's an amazing relationship. Um, they clearly have a relationship for until Eleanor dies. There are days in this relationship where there's great passion. They have letters from the two of them. Eleanor talks about, I can't wait to be with you, hold you in my arms and kiss the corner of your mouth. You can't dismiss that as this flowery Victorian language that you do, you can do that with some people. This is a relationship that's pretty substantive and there's a romantic component to them. They're together all the time. They traveled together incognito, mind you, after Eleanor became first lady all around New England and Canada. And they finally got a, than a, a town in Maine, they were recognized. I can't remember the name of it. Probably because they were from away. Right, hey, those two women traveling, well, that's not thats not right. Um, but they did that for weeks, but no one knew who they were. Um, Lorena helped her understand who she was, helped write her speeches, went with her on these trips, like Earl had done when she was First Lady of New York, helped continue the, to foster Eleanor's understanding of herself and her belief in herself, and it's an amazing, the, the, this book by um, Susan Quinn mm -hmm. really gets at the story. Uh, Susan Quinn. 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 Okay. Really a fascinating um, story. And you can't deny, you can't dismiss it. Be in the past, you said, now they're just really good friends. When you look at the letters, read the letters, you can't deny it anymore. She had a lesbian relationship with this woman for years. Um, they were madly in love with each other. They were seen together. Um, but at some point, that part of the relationship changed. And they have stayed very, very, very good friends the rest of Eleanor's life. I don't think there's a love component there. That often happens to people. You fall in love with someone, you aren't able to stay in love. Things happen. You move on. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are um, not connected anymore. That you don't have feelings for the person. But the dynamics have changed. So I think that's the fascinating part of this too. Mike, uh, uh, yes. Yes, how, how did the uh, uh, timing correlate between her relationship with her bodyguard and with Hickok? There's a slight overlap, um, but Hickok kind of really got in, into Eleanor's life um, during the presidency, right before the presidency, kind of into that stuff. They were friends. But there's a, there's a dynamic, I think, that when they take that vacation together, that trip, that's kind of like they're finding each other. Does that make sense? That's, to me, that's the cementing of the relationship. And it, an amazing thing is that the, it, it doesn't get reported forever. I mean, it, it flies under the radar. Um, and it's, but it's pretty, it's like Jack Kennedy and all his girlfriends. They're there, people know, but people didn't report this stuff back then. It was a different world. But when the story comes out, it's like the Lucy Mercer's when it breaks in the press and you have paperwork and letters. There are copies of letters in the book um, about from the two of them um, that, you know, you can't deny it anymore. They um, ended up, Hick lived at the White House for a time. Um, Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, No Ordinary Time, talked about her living there. Um, Harry Hopkins lived there. Other people lived at the White House like it was a family home. So even when the, when the Arder egg cooled, Lorraine Hickok is still a big part of, of Eleanor Hickok, Eleanor Roosevelt's life. Although when she dies, she's somewhat forgotten and she's buried in an unmarked grave. It takes people later to go and say, let's put a marker on this grave and talk about who she was and what she meant to the Roosevelts. So um, to say it, she was a great friend of Eleanor's is true, but there's a romantic component to it. There's a physical component to it, I think. Um, reading between the lines a little bit. And at the end, who cares? 
this is Eleanor Roosevelt's life, not mine, not ours. It's how she wants to live it and what, what brings her joy and peace and harmony and love for a woman who has such problems with self-image and self-worth. Good for her. Good for her. But Lorraine Hancock is also like Earl Miller. She's listening. She's writing. She writes speeches for Eleanor. She helps her write her column. She gives her all this great sustenance as they as they as the relationship changes. But at times things change and it's a different relationship. But I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt is very lucky. She falls in love with Franklin, falls in love with Earl Miller when she needs him, falls in love with Lorena Hickok, and she falls in love with again, I think, towards the end of her life. Um, she's a woman who has a great capacity to give of herself, not just to the country, not just to the job as first lady but to individuals. Um, and I think you can't define it. You can't say Eleanor Roosevelt was a lesbian. Clearly she wasn't. Did she have an affair? With the, yes. So how do we define her? But we just can't define her. Leave her. She's the person. When she loved, she loved wholeheartedly and gave 100% of herself. And that's an amazing part of the story, I think. Um, so it makes the Roosevelt. And I think Franklin knew that. And he didn't bother with it. It's like, that's... If, if, if she's happy, he knew, I think, the whole time what he had done had, had really hurt Eleanor deeply. And if this can help Eleanor process and become a better person, good for her. And he gets a benefit out of it, too, because they're both listening and, and writing down stuff that he needs to hear as president. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful story. And we like to have the salacious weekly world news kind of, Eleanor Roosevelt was a lesbian. <laughs> Obviously, Eleanor Roosevelt had a, had, a, had, a, had a relationship with a woman, and it was meaningful for both of them, and they loved each other very much. And how awesome is that? Because it helped them be a better person. We should all have friendships gravitate through our lives that do that for us, whether they go down a romantic path or they're not. But that's how Eleanor chose to manifest this stuff. I think it's a great... And Quinn's book is absolutely fantastic. Um, so, they're, and, you know, they're an interesting couple, so... If you want to read more about that, read Sally or Sarah Quinn's book. It's really fascinating. So Eleanor towards the end of her life, Franklin's died. She's still friends with Lorraine Hickok, but they're not on the same scale anymore. And she, her health starts to decline, and so she wants a doctor, a good doctor. And so she finds a doctor, and i got to make sure I spell his name right, because it's an interesting name, David Gerwich. Um, and he, hang on. Um, is born in Switzerland and moves to the United States, becomes a doctor, um, and they meet through a mutual friend, a guy who wrote, I think, one of the first books, well, not the first book, this book, <clears throat> Eleanor and Franklin by Joseph Lance. It's a great book. This is the book the miniseries is based on. It's a fascinating read. Lash, L-A-S-H. Now, Joe Lash was an intimate of Eleanor. She was a very good friend of hers. Um, it was helped her out when she was with the UN and, and things of that nature. She wrote these books. Um, Eleanor and Franklin were another one called Eleanor the Years Alone. But his wife Trudy meets this Dr. Gerwitz. She knows him. She knows Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and Eleanor's looking for a doctor. And so they said, well, there's this Dr. Gerwitz. He's, he's a nice guy. Why don't you talk to him? and something clicks. He becomes a personal physician and he travels with her all around the world for the last part of her life. If there's a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt in the last few years of her life, traveling around the world, he's often in the picture. He's never very far away from her. Clearly, he's become more than her personal physician. The letters between the two of them, and his, he got married in the middle of his relationship with Eleanor and Eleanor and the Gerwitches lived in the same house together. They lived together. And clearly his wife knew what was going on. But the letters between her and David, I wish I had that book too. But again, i would given that book back to the library. And then the coronavirus hit. I had no access to it. But it's very clear that she's in love with him. She's 72 years old. Now, did this get into a physical relationship? That's what everyone wants to know. That's what all this relationship gossip is about. We don't know. But clearly, she loved him very, very much. He was a rock for her in the last few years of his, her life. He was with her, um, and I think it's a really touching relationship that she had. I think the fact that she just didn't care what people thought about her relationships speaks a lot to Eleanor Roosevelt. The fact that she 
like I said, love people that she loved because she loved them, because there was a simpatico moment between the two of them and it, it changed the dynamics. I think it's fascinating to kind of watch these triangles, clearly triangles, as someone said, suit Eleanor Roosevelt, because you've got her and Lorraine Hickok and FDR, her and David Gerwitz and his wife, her and Earl Miller and FDR. He, FDR, these triangles are just interesting to watch the dynamics. But I don't get the sense that there's a triangle that where part of it's being hidden. Like she's not that compartmentalized. Does that make sense? She's open about it. She is who she is. I think that's part of what makes her such a fascinating person. Um, is that she has Franklin cut relationships off and got rid of people left and right. He's a politician. She didn't have to do that. She wasn't a politician. At least as we understand the word. She's a very good politician. Don't get me wrong. But um, I think this is a fascinating part of the Roosevelt study that we're just starting to get past the initial discovery of these relationships where we go, ooh, ooh wow. And we look at what the relationship meant to them. And I think that's an important part of history. These are people. They're not just figures in the book. They're people who have real emotions. And it helps us, I think, as lay people, to use a bad word, understand that they're just like us. We, too, have relationships. We, too, get angry at people. We, too, are betrayed. We, too, get frustrated. We, too, don't want to do the jobs we have. But so did they. And I think that's what makes them so compelling. So... Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Everybody's still awake? Everybody with us? Everybody's uh, Mike? Awake? Yes, ma'am. Again, where are all the kids when all this is happening? Oh, the, we'll talk about the kids next week. Oh, okay. Thank okay. you. That's right. Yeah, the <laughs> kids are around. But the kids, I mean, Franklin's attitude is, you know, I'm a really important guy. And I gave you all the love I had when I was younger. And just go do your stuff now. And, that's, and, they, and, and they... they there's a real struggle with the kids and their father and Eleanor. Remember, this is the mom who thought it was an okay idea to put the kids in a crate outside the back window of their townhouse. That's what the kids are outside. It's, in some ways, they're late. I think part of the deal is the relationship with the kids are so fraught and it begins to build up resentment. I think the kids aren't, you know, they're the kids, but there's like, dad, why don't you love me? And they have to find love somewhere else. The, and the kids try to all, between the five of them, there are 19 marriages. Yeah, they, they like marriage a lot. They want to keep trying it, or something's not clicking. So okay. there are books yet to be written on the psychological impact of the Roosevelt and their children. Um, okay. So we'll talk a bit about that in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. So Wednesday night, seven o'clock. I will start sending email at about twenty to seven. Um, my plan is to have all of you. Um, when you get on, just mute and be quiet. When Catherine comes on, everyone's on. I will introduce her as Missy Lahand. When she is done talking, then you can ask questions. Do the same thing we do here. Unmute, ask her a question. She's happy to entertain questions. I think you're really going to enjoy her. Um, I know she's heartbroken that she couldn't come and visit us in person. Um, but that's just how things go. I did hear from the Hyde Park people, and apparently they're not allowed to do remote learning from the house during the coronavirus. Huh. I don't know, but they're not going to be joining us unless that changes before class is done. Um, anyhow. All right. Any Thank other you. questions? Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Enjoy the yucky, gray, rainy day. Ann Sullivan, I will call you this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Be good. Stay Thank you very much. Thank Yay. You. See ya. Okay. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Mike. Yep.